mainly about the quality assurance in this open source project. All right, so first, uh, let me quickly go through the history of the PySF. So last year, that was uh, the fifth year of, of the birth of this project. Since the first commit, I submitted to GitHub. That was 2014. Um, by then, it was just a interface to call the integral library, libcint, written by me. Um, and after five years development, uh, we now you can find there uh, uh, a long list of feature availables in this package, including the regular um, quantum chemistry methods for molecules and uh, uh, and even some cutting edge scientific studies to uh, uh, for molecules. And about three years ago, we introduced the features to targeting crystal systems. And we implemented the regular uh, mean field theory, correlation method, and even some property calculations for cr crystal. I'm not gonna go through all the features we developed uh, in the package in the, uh, uh, in the past. And most of the features and the technical details and the program designs uh, are available in this paper, uh, Journal of Chemical Physics, we published earlier this year. All right, so um, in, the, in this year, we're not silent. Uh, after the paper pub published, uh, we actually uh, uh, introduced, uh, added many features. Uh, from um, here, we, I just uh, highlight some of the uh, features we added this year. Um, uh, so most of the contributions we made uh, to this project is the uh, PVC features including the property calculations like nuclear gradients, uh, the polarizabilities for the PVC systems, and we are able to do electron phonon Hamiltonian on the PVC, and also some correlation uh, um, calculations for PVC. And recently I added a, a range separated the JK build. I will uh, quickly address this uh, in a few minutes. And also we added some electron correlation methods uh, this year. Uh, uh, for example, the RADC, UADC, a, a, a very interesting correlation method developed by Alex uh, Sokolov uh, from Ohio, Ohio University. That's a, and also um, like some co uh, couple cluster uh, type of correlation methods. And, that, and we also introduced many improvements over the fundamental functional, functionalities, including the integral libraries in the, and the DFT functional groups of DFT functional libraries, uh, th which allows us to do um, more type, more wide range of DFT functionals uh, in, the, in the code, in the package. Uh, in the past, I was um, constantly asked about the treatment of the electron repulsion integrals in the PVC conditions. So when, when we do the PVC basis, it's a really a challenge to compute the two electron integrals. The reason is simple that um, unlike in uh, molecules, the integrals, especially the color integrals in PVC are uh, diverged. So we have to, we have to, um, ha we have to sum up the, the electron repulsion integrals with the uh, nuclear attraction part to make the, the, the total value finite. So the, the, it involves many tricks to tune the uh, summation to, uh, to get the right answer. So at the beginning, we first did set up the method. Later, we call the FFTDF. That's a um, fast forward transform based basis uh, method. Basically, we can uh, use the density feeding formula to understand what happens in this uh, formalism. That is, the, uh, uh, we use the plane wave basis as the auxiliary basis just working like a density feeding auxiliary basis in this four electron integrals formula. And then the metric uh, we introduced here is just a inner dot of the plane waves. That's a direct function. Um, so in short, this is, pre uh, this is a efficient method for pure DFT calculations. Since in pure, pure DFT calculations, we typically just need to compute the density and the potential uh, uh, induced by this density. 
So using fa a fast Fourier transform, we can, we can just quickly compute to the density in real space, transform them to the Fourier space, and transform back to get the potential. And the, the defects is uh, obvious that when we do using this trick to do more complicated uh, methods, for example, uh, including hard fork exchange, it's really slow. This is because the cost to do the tra uh, Fourier transform is roughly uh, proportional to the size of the system times a large constant. And also by doing this, it's quite picky on the basis and the pseudo potential since we have to evaluate things in real space. Be due to this, um, those uh, defects, we developed uh, uh, other uh, uh, solutions to solve those problems. For example, the AFTDF, which is also based on Fourier transform. Or in other words, the fitting basis is still the plane waves. Um, the, in this method, we do not use the faster or discrete Fourier transform. We directly the compute to the uh, Fourier transform, the uh, quantities in, in, in the momentum space so that it can overcome certain defects of the uh, fast Fourier transform density feeding. That was uh, saying that we, we are able to do, um, we are able to uh, get the uh, uh, density feeding tensor in, in the formula above, like the IJP in a, in a single core. So that, uh, that means that we don't have to waiting for the time consuming FFT uh, transform. The, but the defects of this FTDF is almost the same as FFTDF. It still re require, require a, a proper basis set and the pseudo potential to targeting the, uh, the system. Be and, uh, otherwise we have to use, uh, use a huge and enormous number of plane waves to describe the core electrons and um, and then, and then just like FFTDF, and typically it was slow for uh, calculations involved, for example, hard fork exchange or uh, integral transformation. So later we, uh, to overcome the issues in uh, Fourier transform the uh, VFT based uh, methods, we, in, we in introduced the uh, Gaussian density feeding and the mixed density feeding methods. In these two methods, we, um, the feeding base is basically uh, dominated by the Gaussians. Since we, the experience in molecular um, methods tells us what we need is uh, a prop um, auxiliary basis to describe the local densities. So that means uh, uh, plane waves typically are not necessary to, um, to expand the, uh, uh, the product I dot IJ, uh, the pair density. So, uh, and the, by introducing the Gaussian density feeding, we are able to handle hard focus change in an efficient way. We are able to deal with the steep basis functions. That's a big step, um, and uh, uh, without loss too many, um, uh, uh, without loss the accuracy. And uh, um, uh, uh, but in the density feeding, uh, Gaussian density feeding formula, uh, different um, defects we found is. Uh, it has um, requirements on auxiliary basis functions. That was not always available in many, uh, for many um, basis provided in the periodic calculations. And uh, the other issue is that it has to compute the density uh, feeding tensor at the beginning. It was a quite slow step. And uh, uh, the sim uh, similar things observed in the uh, uh, mixed density feeding. Um, uh, it, it's even slower than Gaussian density feeding. However, it has a better accuracy. So overall, we have developed uh, many uh, density feeding based uh, method to targeting the electron repulsion integrals. But when people using the density feeding integrals uh, in the real applications, it still complains about that um, it's not able to targeting a large uh, hard fork type of exchange in the PVC calculations. Because the, um, so um, that brings me to think about to build up uh, an, another way to compute exchange. It was not a really a new method and the similar ideas can be found in 
uh, CP2K or Crystal um, package uh, in which uh, we basically uh, compute the uh, integrals in, in the in both in real space plus the momentum space. So this slide summarizes the uh, rough idea. Um, the, the electron repulsion integrals, if we return explicitly in the row ij times row kl times the color metric one of r12 and integrate over the r1 and r2, um, they, it involves roughly three times the pair density row ij, pair density row kl, and then the color metric r1 of r12. So um, all of the three terms um, uh, can be decomposed further into the local part uh, and a smooth or diffused part in real space. For example, in the row ij, the pair density, uh, we can we can uh, we can partition them to the um, the compact the product of two compact uh, crystalline orbitals, the product of compact times diffused crystal orbitals, and uh, the product of the, uh, and the, the product of diffuse times compact orbitals. They are still compact density. And uh, the product of two diffused functions, that would most like a diffused or smooth density in the real space so that we can um, uh, partition the rho ij uh, terms into the two type of um, densities, two types of pair densities. And uh, the, the partitioning of the cooling metric is relatively speaking simpler. Uh, just uh, uh, the, of course, uh, multiple ways and a, a very straightforward way is just using the um, coolant attenuation, the, which uh, gives us the long range part ERF and the short range part ERFC. Okay, then the long range part is um, by name, it's, it's mostly working, need, it, mo it needs the long range real space integration that's it's smooth and it works mostly smooth. And, and the long range part. Uh, is is local in the momentum space. So it's preferred to evaluate the long range part in the momentum space and the short range part in the real space. So overall, this integral, the electron repulsion integrals, um, we can you can you can uh, analyze it using uh, with eight type of combinations. So for example, this LLL in the right panel, that means the local part in the product rho ij plus the local part for the color metric, which is the uh, ERFC, the short range uh, integral, and plus the uh, local part of the row KL. And we finally decided to evaluate them in real space. It involves two, nine terms and from the uh, uh, row IG and the row KL. And a similar analysis can be done to the other types of combinations. So they are eight, type of combinations involving um, 32 types of integrals. And uh, most of them can be evaluated in momentum space after some trial and error. Uh, uh, that's the final uh, decision that uh, what, how to evaluate them. Um, and this seems to give the best uh, uh, performance. And the, the, uh, the challenge part in this um, uh, algorithm is that um, it's not just like the molecular, uh, the open boundary conditions in the molecular case. The integrals can be done just in one shot. There are many boundary needs to be determined to evaluate the integrals. For example, how to converge the uh, summation over many Gaussians to ensure that um, the error we neglect can, the error uh, is negligible. Um, and uh, this is a, a challenge, and uh, uh, and uh, it involves at least the the range, the parameter for range, the parameter for the uh, momentum space cutoff, the uh, and the uh, the the value of the omega to give the prop choice of the um, range separation for the coulomb metric. Anyway, it was done right now, and. Uh, and here is some of the preliminary, preliminary results. Um, so you, you can find that I list, uh, this is a, a diamond um, crystal. Uh, the, the primitive cell uh, is a cubic cell of the diamond uh, crystal with eight, uh, eight carbon items. 
And in this calculation, I tried uh, a, a regular um, uh, type of uh, PBC, uh, DF, uh, PBC setup using pseudo potential and uh, a small basis set called G, uh, single zeta uh, valence uh, basis called GTHSZV. And also uh, all electron calculations with CCPVDZ basis. Um, in this uh, typical uh, crystal basis, it has 32 basis functions in each cell. And for CCPVDZ, it's 112 basis functions. And apparently, uh, I was too ambitious to, uh, to, to get all the results. Uh, the cost is still above my uh, estimation at the beginning. I wish I could finish uh, all the from two by two by two K points to, to 10 by 10 by 10 K points in the regular G, uh, PVC basis and at least the three calculations for CCPVDZ basis. But uh, um, by, uh, before the, by the, uh, the talk beginning, I only finished the, those numbers as you see in the screening. And it's all done by uh, on my uh, desktop. It's just a, a single CPU, eight, a 10 core CPU uh, with 64 gigabytes memory. And the CPU hour means the, the single core time. Um, and uh, you can find that um, uh, the even for the eight by eight by eight k points calculations, which involves actually uh, five hundred twelve um, images of the uh, primitive cell, which counts uh, roughly four thousand atoms, it just takes one one hundred and twenty seven hours to finish this calculation. It's actually a really huge calculation. Um, the that 4,000 atoms is just uh, from the simple math that um, from k points times the number of atoms in the unit cell. The actual uh, integrals it involves uh, needs much more than this number. This is because we have to converge um, the diffused Gaussian basis in the real space. So it often involves like a thousand of images, um, uh, repeated images to converge those diffused functions and that which uh, finally, uh, gives uh, requests like twenty thousand basis function to just uh, targeting this small systems, and for all electrons uh, uh, case, it's actually um, finally needs like thirty thousand basis to do to do the simple calculations. So this is a really huge problem, but it can be done right now in the desktop in just a few. Uh, if you do them parallelly, it's just uh, in in one day. In most of the calculations, okay. I'm, I will stop off the uh, the method uh, uh, progress here and uh, move to the the quality assurance in the in the pack package. So in the last year, we actually have like forty um, k around forty k lines added in the code, and with more than seventy um, uh, features added in the code, and there are many contributors involved. And in this package, we now in, uh, used by about 260 projects. So uh, obviously, it's very important to ensure that the, uh, the code, whenever we have new features, or whenever we uh, add, uh, improve the existing code, we need to ensure the, the code quality does not really uh, become worse. And um, it, the change, so, it's the, tra the transition roughly happens in the ver version 1.4 around the 2017. Um, before that point, the mainly uh, the code just uh, has uh, a bunch of tests. Uh, but uh, later after that point, introduced by um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Williams. Actually, I never m meet this person. Um, that's the amazing part of the open source project. He contributed to the main framework of the uh, test automation that he built up the Travis CI on GitHub. And later, uh, uh, after that that uh, uh, change, uh, I would say the PySF becomes the, uh, is gradually moved to the DevOps, uh, uh, DevOps flow that uh, uh, automatic, uh, automatically do the testing, automatically do the release and documentation, etc. So, in, about the tests, right now the the package covered by 
roughly 2,000 tests. And uh, this test covered uh, 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 oh, more than 83% of the code. And, and they are run, they are run on Git, GitHub uh, uh, CI um, trigger. Uh, every, every time people submit a commit or submit a pull request. And, uh, by, uh, by, and, and many of the tests are actually from the uh, GitHub issues and the bug reports. So we basically just adding uh, the, the, the tests whenever we solve a bug, a bug uh, report on GitHub. And, the, and most of the important modules of this package was, was, carved, uh, was heavily carved for example, like the Hutch Fork module, we, we have 200 tests and uh, with uh, over 90% of the total coverage. Uh, I know that it's in the view of the like uh, a traditional IT, in the view of viewpoint of IT side, this is not a really high coverage, but for a, uh, for a like the fastly develop, developing um, pro program, program package, it's not a bad number, I would say that's have the most important features we need the, in the daily running. And when we do the test automation, since the, um, uh, the Travis CI introduced by Mark Williamson, um, we found that the unit test running on Travis CI has some issues that um, Travis CI have a hard limit on the time that you cannot use more than one hour to run the tests, the automation tests. So that that enforced us to uh, to use small tests at the beginning. That's why if you look at the tests in the PySF test package, uh, most of the tests are just running less than one second. Um, and later we uh, we moved uh, uh, to uh, GitHub Flow CI. Uh, it's a different uh, continue, continuous integration um, framework uh, hosted on mostly, as far as I know, on Azure micro. Microsoft Azure Cloud, and it allows us to use more resource. And this happens this year, mainly still uh, conducted by uh, Mark Williamson. And right now we are running the tests for Mac OS and the Linux uh, systems uh, covering Python 2.7 and uh, Python, most of the Python 3 uh, pack, uh, distributions. And uh, they are triggered by the git push and the git pull, pull request. So it's um, we I would say that it covers most uh, running scenario in our uh, daily using. And we for the merge request and the code auditing right now we do have a very strict uh, code reviewing requirements. Basically, we just need the <coughs> the pull requests uh, uh, pass all the tests uh, we have set up. And the, the, the new features just need to have examples and the, some documents and the reference in the code. And, uh, and we have very moderated the code style inspection and the, uh, uh, and the implementation and validation. And the mostly it was done by me and uh, uh, Shane and the Garnet from Caltech and James and the uh, Tim from uh, Flatiron and the Alex from Ohio and the Sandy from Boulder. Uh, so uh, we are actually really appreciate if people can contribute to the code reviewing, although it's, we never really uh, announced that we need like a reviewer to help us, but it's really uh, helpful if people who knows the theory can, com com uh, can comment on the new pull request on GitHub that really helpful. And, the la uh, and one, one of the important steps in the continuous integration is the, to uh, release or deli de delivery to deliver or deliver the product, and in our case, we deliver the uh, the package in mostly three the three channel: the PyPy, the Conda, and the Docker Hub. And on PyPy, we build the wheels because we noticed that uh, compiling the uh, Python uh, wheels from scratch is a little bit um, messy and it's often fails. So that we release wheels, but actually, build the wheels is not a um, happy work. Uh, this is because we try to cover as, as many platform as possible. So uh, especially for Linux, there are so many distributions and so many different architecture. And finally, I used the solution provided by the Py PyPy community. It was running a PyPy Docker. Uh, it, 
I am, I'm, I'm not gonna go to the details of how to build the PyPy. It's gonna be a long story to support the, uh, to make the PyPy wheels uh, support the external libraries. Um, and the, and the uh, thing about the Conda Cloud, the Conda Cloud is relatively speaking more convenient than PyPy, but uh, recent, uh, we constantly find that Conda, Conda distribution uh, has certain uh, issues on the libraries, especially the system libraries. It leaks some system libraries that will mess up the uh, the system environment. And uh, the Docker is a recently um, popular framework in the I world of IT. And I would say that's a really uh, good framework, although we didn't really spend too much time on, on the Docker image. I mean, and optimize the distribution from the Docker image. Uh, basically, we provided the Docker image, and uh, in the future, I would guess that will be a uh, main release for the package, since you can find that the either uh, PyPy and the Conda has its own issue, and uh, basically they are solved in Docker images. And about the documentation, we, we right now have the uh, documentation automatically generated and uploaded to the um, uh, uploaded to the web to the official web. PySafe.org, you can find the online documentation here. And, uh, um, the, and the we, we have the uh, most of the documents written directly in the code so that uh, when, you, when you run the code in the, for example, Jupyter Notebook, or you, if you look at, uh, view the code directly, it's helpful to just understand the, what the function is, uh, is doing rather than checking out the doc, uh, online documentation. And the, in, the, in the code, uh, in the package, we uh, we also distribute about uh, uh, 600 uh, examples, including the uh, independent examples for each functionality, for each feature, and the uh, inline uh, examples, which was written in the log strings. So that if you using Ju Jupyter Notebook, for example, you can just uh, uh, read the doc string to see how to use certain API calls. Uh, okay, let, let me go to the end. The, uh, of the PySafe QA. So basically we have done the very fundamental, uh, the very beginning CI level. That means we can do the automation testing. We did some, uh, oh, we have a uh, release uh, channel that covers many platforms and we have a documentation. Uh, that's basically the very fundamental CI. And uh, there are still many things missing in the uh, QA steps. Since QA, it's not just the, a testing procedure. It also covers the community support, uh, the uh, the quality, as the name tells, the quality assurance. So it also including like static anal analysis, like the uh, the performance assessment, etc. Uh, it was not yet done, but that's the future plan of the PSF, especially in the PSF two release. All right, that's it. Uh, I will stop here. And uh, oh, question time. Thank you very much for your talk. So uh, I think we have a one short question we can have. Uh, okay. Wenjun, do you wanna give a talk, give, give, a, give a question? You're not, <laughs> okay. Then maybe I will give a, a short question. Uh, uh, many of the uh, what you're talking about the last part uh, I really don't understand because I don't know much about Python so uh, but uh, uh, but you you actually compare you actually done a Gaussian basis at uh, the periodic boundary uh, mm -hmm. the programs uh, how how much better as compared to plan wave based one like a BASP uh, I will not really uh, comment on a comment on which place is better, but at least uh, you know in quantum chemistry we developed so many methods, so many uh, bases. So we needed to take the advantage of the, all those efforts we put in the quantum chemistry. So that's the basically that's the only choice, especially when we do correlation, like electron correlation. There's almost no way to use plane waves. I see, I see. Then the, can you actually uh, implement the TDDFT like uh, to the periodic case? 
TBTF yes, it's for the XRS already state. Already oh, it's, it's already done. Already supported, yes. Oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, do you really need uh, uh, diffuse functions for uh, solid state? Yes. Um, of course, for like insulator or semiconductor, it's okay to just use the uh, local basis, but for the metal type of calculations, yes, it's preferred to have certain uh, diffused functions, as far as I know. Uh, I can't believe it, because even for metals, you have uh, electron screening and uh, the diffuse functions. I mean, you have so many items. Uh, this function on one atom can be shared by all other atoms. Uh, I don't think you need a real diffuse function there. Uh, I don't have a direct comparison. Um, just, uh, just I mean, based on the published results, most uh, metal type of calculations involve a huge number of k points, which means that it actually corresponding to a calculation of a system with like diffused uh, feature. Otherwise, we don't have to targeting such big k points. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Shina Kim from Iowa State University. She is going to talk about analytic gradients. Uh, Shina, could you share your screen? Yep. And if you're ready, you can go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, finally, almost the end. Um, first, I would like to thank Dr. Choi and the organizers for the opportunity to give me a talk today. Um, uh, oh, okay. So um, yeah, opportunity to give me a talk today. Um, since it is the last day and then probably want to enjoy beer and start cooking turkey, I'll make my presentation concise and professional as possible. So today I will uh, talk about analytic gradient of uh, EFMO charge transfer energy. So from past four days of presentation, we've seen various methods and then platforms to calculate large molecules such as protein and novel materials. Um, it shows how important it is to predict inter interactions in large chemical systems. Then how do we calculate large molecular system efficiently and accurately? The common but challenging approach is a high level QN calculation using fragmentation method. As we talk about the uh, legacy scientific software here, um, games has been putting a lot of effort to develop uh, effective, accurate and computationally efficient fragmentation methods such as FMO, EFP and EFML. Um, the development of fragmentation method in games has played a very important role towards massive parallel computing. And then it is suitable for the massive parallel computing capability as well since each fragment can be computed essentially independently of every other fragment. So this means that the computational bottleneck reduces from the uh, entire molecular system to the largest fragment itself. So first, I'll go over the background of FMO. Um, the FMO method was first released in games in 2004. Um, FMO is a QM method that is capable of evaluating the properties of a large molecular system by fragmenting in two ways. Um, first, covalently bonded molecules are divided into uh, fragment pieces so as not to destroy the bond electron pairs. And then um, second molecule itself can be a fragment as a whole. FMO can do two body and three body interaction energy calculations and analytic gradient is also available along with the other initial method in games. The largest system computed with FMO is FMO2 DFTB in, with games, um, which has about 1.2 to 10 to the six atoms reported by Dr. Nishimoto and then Dr. Uh, Fedorov. Um, the con side of the FMO is that SCF procedure has to be evaluated for individual fragments until all the fragments are converged. Uh, this sometimes the 
it, this sometimes makes the gradient calculation um, very difficult and inexpensive. Um, the second fragment method is EFP. The EFP was originally designed for the treatment of solvent effect on chemical reactions, but it has more recently been used to study clusters of solvent molecules and environmental effect in biomolecular systems and then highly charged systems like um, ionic liquid. The unique aspect of EFP is that it uses rigid fragments, which are frozen molecular orbitals. And then, um, and yeah. Um, so the lastly, the EFMO uses fermentation scheme of FMO and an ever initial force field EFP method. Um, now the rigid body system that was in EFP should be considered as a flexible body system and then still account for the long range and short range interaction and the many body terms. Moreover, um, as transitioning to exascale computing uh, involves multi-grain, massive, and flexible parallelization of the code, adoption of the accelerators, and use of uh, uh, bandwidth and the memory structures and so on. Um, the EFMO method becomes very adaptable to exascale computing. While I take more of a theory-oriented role, there are brilliant members in our group who dedicate themselves working on exascale computing, a code for the FMO and EFMO specifically. Um, so EFMO energy expression is a combination of the gas phase, every initial terms, and then EF, EFP interaction energy terms. So from the point of view of F FMO, um, the importance of the EFMO method is the best appreciated in the context of um, FMO separated dimer approximation. And as a criteria for the separated dimers, there are two parameters that we have to take account. Um, the first one is a user defined cutoff value, which is R cut, and then the minimum distance between two fragments. So if the minimum distance is smaller than the user defined value R cut, then the energy is calculated by every initial terms. But if the minimum distance between the, um, the fragment is larger than the interaction is calculated by EFP method. So, um, the, moving on to the gradient der derivation of the EFMO, uh, most of terms for the EFMO gradient is um, derived and implemented by Dr. Colin Bertoni in um, Argo National Lab, but uh, charge transfer energy term is not um, implemented yet. So from here, charge transfer uh, by definition is the, uh, um, the overlap of occupied orbitals in fragment A to the virtual orbital of fragment B. And it's a pair, pairwise action, so uh, vice versa also works as well. So as, um, um, as a, a strategy for EFM or charge transfer gradient, we have to examine each term separately, um, which terms can be reused from EFP because all the um, EFM or charge transfer gradient starts from EFP charge transfer energy expression. Um, the uh, the important thing about charge transfer gradient is that it's using canonical orbitals instead of localized orbitals in an occupied uh, area, or occupied space. So um, all the terms are derived in terms of canonical orbitals. So this is a, a general derivation of EFMO charge transfer gradient. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the energy term is starting from the EFP charge transfer energy. And as is, it says, Pairwise reaction is a charge transfer energy from A to B and then charge transfer energy to B to A. And then all these blue terms are actually derived. Um, well, before that, we take the derivative of uh, EFP charge transfer energy and then all the blue color terms are the ones that can be saved and reused from EFP charge transfer energy gradient. And then we have to um, focus on the derivative terms. So M coefficient derivative terms are now expressed as response matrix. And here, the reusable terms, which are non-response terms, are summed up and then saved in Lagrangian matrices. And then now we have all the response terms. Um, and then this can be solved by a couple of the hartree fogg method or the vector method. And as, an, as I mentioned multiple times, um, it is a pairwise interaction. So um, 
charge transfer gra gradient from fragment A to B, B to A are all summed up at the end of the uh, gradient calculations. So as a computational scheme, first we calculate the RHF energy and orbitals, and then we move on to make EFP part, which is necessary for uh, generating all the um, parameters that we need for doing EFP. And then we calculate multiple moments polarizability, and then we move on to EFP many body polarization. And um, from there, we also save non-response and response terms from there. Then we move on to uh, dimer calculation. So if the, um, the distance between two fragments are greater than the user input value, as I mentioned earlier, we move on to EFP uh, energy calculation. And if it is smaller, then we move on to the, uh, the EBI initial calculations. So in dimer EFP uh, energy calculation, first we calculate the Coulomb uh, dispersion and then exchange repulsion energy and gradient first, because these terms are actually using LMOs for occupied um, orbitals. So we calculate the response terms and non-response terms separate and then uh, save each terms in the appropriate matrix. And then we move on to uh, calculate the overlap. So if two fragments overlap is greater than 0 0.05, then um, we calculate the EFP charge transfer energy and then its gradient. So from there also um, response term, non-response terms are separated. And then we move on to calculating the EFMO charge transfer gradient using CML. And then at the end of the calculation, the log file will generate will show all the EFP energies and the EFMO gradient as well. Um, so the code is still in process of uh, progress progress of implementation, and then as it is finished, it, it will go through the, all the systematic testings before public release. And right now, I'm working on the increase of accuracy for total EFMO gradient. Um, also, um, large virtual orbital space, since we are using canonical orbitals as a bottleneck sometimes to calculate the uh, accurate charge transfer energy. So, um, and then gradient. So we can consider implementing uh, uh, balanced virtual orbitals for the virtual space in future if it is necessary. So um, please look forward to it. So um, that's short, concise, and I think I expressed pretty much everything that's important. So uh, thank you again for Dr. Gordon and then um, the committee members for this great opportunity and then all Gordon group members, especially um, the former members as well, like Dr. Colin Bertoni in our Argonne National Lab, Dr. Peng Su, Wu Pam, and uh, Dr. Mike Schmidt. So thank you and then any questions?